Today, I'm delighted to be introducing Matthew Lee, an Arts and Humanities Research Council funded PhD candidate. Matthew is jointly supervised by the University of Aberdeen and the National Library of Scotland as part of the Scottish Cultural Heritage Consortium. Matthew's PhD is entitled Private Reflections and Public Pronouncements, Caribbean Slavery in the Scottish Consciousness, 1750 to 1834. It rolls off the tongue, I have to say. <laughs> Matthew has <coughs> also has a bachelor's degree in history from Strathclyde University and a postgraduate degree in Scottish history from Glasgow University. During today's talk, Matthew is going to draw from insights gained during a recent cataloguing project to reveal the interesting and complicated story of Scotland's involvement in the slave trade as contained in the library's collections. So to, to tell us more, please give a warm library welcome to Matthew Lee. Thanks everybody. Often when you do a talk right after lunchtime, you start to see people sort of nodding off and things like that as they're digesting, but I can tell you're all a high octane crowd, so that won't be a problem. Uh, so yeah, thank you for coming to my talk and good afternoon. Um, as Kenny mentioned, my name is Matthew Lee and I'm a PhD student, co-supervised here at the National Library of Scotland and the University of Aberdeen. Uh, my PhD examines how Scottish writers of the 18th and 19th centuries wrote about the slave trade and about the, the people and places of the Caribbean. And as part of my funding, I've been undertaking a, a placement in the library's archive and manuscripts department to catalogue slavery related manuscript materials held in the library's collections. So a few words before I get into the talk properly. Uh, first of all, some of the things that I'm going to talk about today aren't particularly cheery. Obviously, they pertain to the slave trade. Um, and some of the pictures that will appear on the screen contain overt mentions of slave trading and the names of enslaved people themselves. So you're obviously under no obligation to stay in the room. If you find anything like that upsetting, please feel free, free to just excuse yourself. Just to define a couple of terms as well before we get any further. First of all, manuscripts, I'm sure many of you know this anyway, but just to clarify, manuscripts are handwritten documents, for example, letters or diaries. So when I refer to manuscript material, I mean something that's actually been handwritten as opposed to a printed source like a book. Uh, when I talk about the slave trade, what I actually am talking about is the Atlantic slave trade, um, as mentioned up on the screen there, whereby people from Europe went to Africa, enslaved people and took them to different parts of the Americas, as opposed to any other slave trade uh, that, that might have existed in the past. And lastly, um, rather than saying National Library of Scotland over and over again. I'm just going to use the word library with a capital L in inverted commas. So apologies to anyone who's here from a library that hasn't earned a capital L yet. <laughs> uh, the, the title of the talk is as well as um, the, the Scotland and Atlantic slave trade, but I don't propose to offer just a general survey of, of Scotland's history, um, this very long and, the long and deep connections that we have to the Atlantic slave trade. As Kenny mentioned, what I want to do is focus on the material that's actually in the collections here at the library and some of the stories that that, that can unearth. Uh, and again, this is based on the, the project that I did in Archives and Manuscripts Department. Uh, so I'll just give you a quick outline of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so we'll do some, we will do some context, some scene setting. Then we'll talk about the, the project that I did, look at some specific items that are in the collections, what the collections can tell us, so how people like you in this room can use the collections to do research on the slave trade, but also to think about some of the limits uh, and some of the things that's harder to do with, with the manuscript material here at the library and some of the gaps and the silences that we find in archives about enslaved people's lives. So to kick us off then, some historical context. So throughout much of the period after the slave trade and slavery ended, people in Scotland have comforted themselves with the idea that we weren't really involved with it in the first place. Uh, and apparently our role was mostly just as the abolitionist saviours of enslaved people in far off parts of the globe. Now it's true that Scots did play a prominent and in numerical terms disproportionate role in abolitionist campaigns uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries. So for example, 
1792, 13,000 Glaswegians signed a petition against the slave trade. Uh, but for a long time, I would argue, this history of abolitionism, which is important to acknowledge, became the only story that we've told ourselves about our relationship with racial slavery. So an extreme example of this can be found in a copy of the Glasgow Herald from 1883. Glasgow's West India Association, which was set up in 1807 after the slave trade was abolished, so interestingly, the, the pro-slavery lobby in Glasgow didn't get their act together until after the slave trade had been uh, abolished, better late than never, I guess. Um, but the Glasgow Herald um, printed this from the, the Glasgow West India Association. Quote, it is to Glasgow's lasting honour that whilst Bristol and Liverpool were up to their elbows in the slave trade, Glasgow kept out of it. The reproach can never be levelled at our city, as it was at Liverpool, that there was not a stone in her streets that was not cemented with the blood of a slave. Now, Tom Devine, who's one of Scotland's most uh, preeminent modern historians, has cited this quote from the Herald as an example of what he's termed collective amnesia about our role in the slave trade. And other historians have used similar terms to describe the fog that seems to have shrouded our understanding of this part of our past. So Catherine Hall, who helped to develop a, a database of recipients of slave trade compensation money, which is well worth a look at if you're interested in finding out about specific people who were involved in that, a quick Google of UCL slavery database, we'll find that online. Uh, she's talked about disavowal, so sim in similar terms to divine. So it seems that until recently, people in Scotland have remembered to forget about this aspect of our history. As Scotland's direct role in the slave trade, so that is people being enslaved on ships that left from Scottish ports, um, was limited, as to be said. So, for example, a, a 2004 study carried out by Mark Duffel concluded that being between 1706 and 1766, around four to 5,000 men, women and children were enslaved aboard vessels that embarked from Glasgow's to outports of Greenock and Port Glasgow, or Leith or Montrose in, in the northeast of Scotland. So of the millions of people who were transported from various parts of the western coast of Africa to a life of enslavement in the Americas, only a tiny fraction were actually moved aboard vessels that originated from Scotland. But what we have to acknowledge is that the indirect role that Scotland had was much, much deeper and much, much larger. And the emerging and still growing body of historical research into this aspect of Scotland's history has shown this. So there was a, a dense network of Scots who operated in the Caribbean and places in what is now the United States, for example, the Chesapeake and what's now Virginia. Uh, and Scots in, in this part of the world were involved in a range of occupations, either direct, directly in or adjacent to slavery. So, for example, Scots in the Americas were variously plantation owners, overseers, so-called attorneys, so managers of plantations, doctors, bookkeepers. Robert Burns nearly went to Jamaica to become a bookkeeper. Uh, clergymen, soldiers, so on and so forth. The important point to consider here is that although, the, again, the number of enslaved people transported on Scottish ships was a tiny fraction of the overall number, we were very much entangled in the slave trade. And it, we now have a much clearer understanding of this indirect role or a displaced role thanks to the research that's emerging. Uh, the library's collections demonstrate the breadth of, of this engagement. There was, for example, a profusion of Scottish doctors in America and uh, in the Caribbean, which led to their interaction with slavery. So, for instance, Norman Morrison, who was a physician from the Western Isles, emigrated to Connecticut and owned enslaved people. And copies of his letters that are contained in a volume here in the library show that Morrison was actually writing to his friends, offering to sell them people that he owned. And another example of a Scottish doctor implicated in the slave trade is a Colin McClarty, uh, he was part of Jamaica's med medical community, made up by many Scots, and he acquired an estate called Chester Vale on the island. And by 1817, there were around 200 people, enslaved people, working on, or forced to work rather, on this estate. And correspondence from McClarty and some of his associates back to their friends and relatives in Greenock are held here in the library. And I just want to flick quickly. Um, so there's also evidence of enslaved people in Scotland during the, the 18th and 19th century. I'll talk in more detail about a formerly enslaved person later on. Uh, but this newspaper clipping that we can see here um, is actually advertising somewhat a slave for sale. Um, and we also have um, examples from a, a database called the Runaway Slaves Database of newspaper adverts in Scottish newspapers looking for enslaved people who'd run away from their masters' homes. Uh, so again, this 
this advert and others like it confirmed there was a kind of enslaved presence, a presence of people of colour in Scotland back in the 18th and 19th centuries. So let's flip back onto this. And again, although it's true that Scotland was relatively uninvolved in terms of the actual commerce in enslaved people, uh, this country and people who are alive today did benefit from it nevertheless. Uh, as Eric Williams has shown in his 1944 classic book, Capitalism and Slavery, money accrued from the slave trade and from the compensation handed out to the, the owners of enslaved people rather than enslaved people themselves at the end of slavery flowed back into Scotland and helped to finance the Industrial Revolution. So for instance, the compensation money that was handed out at the end of slavery was invested to develop Scotland's railways. So any time you take a, a train journey from Glasgow to Edinburgh, for example, you are benefiting from the legacies of slavery. And that's not to blame anyone or to ask for atonement necessarily, but it is to ask for reflection about the, the structural advantages that we have in this country compared to others. And this is true of, of cities, towns and villages right across Scotland who reap the financial rewards of the Atlantic slave trade. There are also institutional links between Scotland and the slave trade. Our universities are a very good example of this. So you might have seen the, the report that was published by Glasgow University last year or the year before about their financial links to, to the slave trade uh, through donations and things like that for the, the new, the so-called new building, that, the, the new college building that was built in the 1800s. A lot of the, the money that came from that was from people who'd profited from slavery. And my own university, the University of Aberdeen, also benefited from the proceeds of slavery. Uh, for example, I, I worked on a project recently with people from a very small village, very small village indeed, in Aberdeenshire called Thingen, and an Episcopalian reverend from Thingen called Gilbert Ramsay left the village in the late 17th century, and he went to Barbados, owned enslaved people, and actually bequeathed thousands of pounds to the University of Aberdeen in the early 18th century, and that money went to pay for theology lecturers, it went to pay for stipends for people called Ramsey who wanted to go to the University of Aberdeen. Um, and he also actually set up a parish poor fund that was handing out money to the children of, of poor kind of tenant farmers until the 1960s. So this legacy is, you know, within living memory of many people in this room, the legacies of slavery still exist. And now Aberdeen is a bit behind Glasgow in terms of the, the work that the university's done, but I think this still demonstrates the really important civic links uh, between Scotland's institutions and the slave trade. So now we've got a bit of the historical context under our belt, uh, I'm going to move on to discuss the cataloging project that I undertook. Here we go. So as I mentioned at the start of the talk, my PhD is a collaboration between the library and Aberdeen University. And the library's got a number of different collaborations with different universities, with different PhD students doing different topics. And as part of each project, each uh, PhD student does a total of six months work placement at the library. So we get to kind of see behind the scenes and actually kind of work kind of day to day as you would uh, as a normal member of staff. Uh, so during my first placement, which lasted for three months at the end of last year, I undertook this cataloging project to look at the library's slavery collections. So in practical terms, I made my way through around 25 manuscript volumes. 25 might not sound like very much, but try doing it, try doing it every day. Um, and I created records and descriptions for these various volumes uh, in the library's online catalogue. So you can see them now if you went onto the catalogue. Now this project is a very small part of a much bigger strategic priority that the library has. And part of its overarching strategy is to improve access to its collections through a programme of online listing, cataloguing and discovery work to make visible all of the library's special and hidden collections. In the strictest sense, the material that I was cataloguing wasn't hidden in so far as there was some sort of catalogue record for them, no matter how vague or how not particularly well detailed. However, as I say, some of these records didn't really provide enough information or really make clear the explicit slavery links that, that are contained therein. Uh, and the lack of information about these links, particularly for the volumes that have been in the library since the 60s or the 70s, kind of reflects the fact that when they were first brought into the library, they're donated or purchased. They weren't really read for, from this perspective. So you get the odd clue maybe about a, 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 a location or a destination, so Jamaica or Tobago or something like that, but you have to actually go and physically look. Um, and if you were to type in slave trade in the manuscript catalogue, they wouldn't necessarily have come up before I got my hands on them. Uh, so one of the benefits of this cataloging project is now that people like you can go and look at them all uh, or find them much more easily. And I talked about institutional links earlier between universities and the slave trade, 
But I think we have also have to reflect on the fact that the library has in its own way got institutional links to the slave trade and to slavery, because by taking in this material, the library's become a repository for the, the stories and the memory of Scotland's myriad connections to this part of the past, uh, stories that were written largely from the perspective of the enslaver rather than the enslaved. We'll talk about that in more detail later. So this throws up all sorts of interesting and quite complex questions about slavery-related material, including whether or not to purchase it on the open market, because that throws up the question of whether someone, a, a dealer, book dealer, for example, is making money from slavery, the, the, the unfortunate circumstances that, that someone entered hundreds of years ago. Now, I would argue that it is important to build these collections and to confront Scotland's colonial past, but it is important to remember that the material that details this history is, as I said, complex and for many people potentially quite painful. So, I am not a graphic designer, as you can see from this slide. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the interesting things about the slavery collections is it shows the really global scale of Scottish migration and colonisation in the 18th and 19th century. So if we take a step back from the actual uh, content of what's in the letters and look at some of the, the metadata, if you like, in the manuscripts, um, we can get some really important insights. So looking at this map, we can see some... Uh, so these pins are places that are mentioned in the different letters and, and journals that I looked at. So from this, we can see very clearly that Scots were active in the Americas and in the Caribbean and in Africa across this period. So we can see the pins in North America, right down the eastern seaboard, down into the Caribbean, into Guyana, so into, actually into the South American continent. Couldn't quite get the, the whole slide to fit, but if we could go a little bit further south, we would actually even see Scots, a Scots presence in Argentina pertaining to slavery. And we can also see on the bit on Africa, that little pin in West Africa, around about Ghana. We'll talk about that in more detail as well later on. That represents a guy called Richard Holden, who was a, a Scots-born um, slave trader. You also see a pin in East Africa and also obviously all the pins in Scotland and other parts of Britain. So we can see actually the contours of the kind of so-called triangular trade here between Britain, Africa and the Americas. Uh, just zoom in a little bit again not a PowerPoint expert or a graphic designer, but you can see that just the, the sheer number of pins right along the, the Caribbean, right into Guyana. So you can see the kind of proliferation of Scots that were there and the kind of density of the networks. Just zoom out there if you want. We actually have a point here if you want to Oh, great. Technology here. Ah, oh, brilliant. Thank you. And thanks. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much. So thank you to, to Kenny. <laughs> we can see. The, the proliferation of the density of the networks of Scots in the Caribbean and also in the Americas as well. Now, another interesting aspect of this is if we look at the, the, the locations, the Scottish locations that are mentioned in these different manuscripts. And it's tempting to think of Scotland's links to slavery in very Glasgow-centric terms. Maybe I'm saying that because I'm a Glaswegian. I get especially Glasgow-centric when I come to Edinburgh. Um, <laughs> And, you know, obviously it, it's, it's more obvious in Glasgow in terms of place names like Jamaica Street and so forth. However, the material in the library suggests the geographical extent of Scotland's interactions with slavery was truly nationwide. So as you can see from the map, we've got slavery-related items that were created in Campbelltown, down here in the southwest, all the way through up to Turriff in the northeast. And again, <laughs> we've cut off Shetland from the map, but we'll talk about Shetland in more detail so up there somewhere. Um, so we can see that the length and breadth of Scotland, people were involved either directly or indirectly with slavery or knew someone or was corresponding with someone who was involved. And that suggests to me that people right across Scotland need to acknowledge this aspect of our history today. And it's a wee bit too easy to write this off as something that only involved a small number of merchants in Glasgow a long time ago um, and kind of absolving the other parts of the country of its links. And I think this is a part of our past that everyone should at least confront and reflect on. So just to get further into what's actually in the collections, giving you an idea here, so letters, lists, legal documents, account books, drawings, material culture, material artifacts, you know, interesting that that's in a manuscript collection, and also printed works, not manuscripts, but we do have a lot of slavery-related printed material as well. 
So just to get into each of them, I'm going to go through them in turn. So this first item shown on this slide here is a letter from Jamaica written by a woman called Eleanor Affleck to her daughter back in Edinburgh. And it's quite difficult to make out the handwriting on the screen, but the letter states that Affleck's daughter was indeed the legal owner of several enslaved people, and the letter also mentions the compensation money that her daughter will be due after emancipation. And one of the interesting things about, I think, about this letter is the way that these kind of two genteel Edinburgh ladies are talking about the fate of enslaved people and compensation money in such sort of detached and, and cold terms. And on the next slide, we have a list. So this is a list of enslaved people from an estate called Huntley Estate in Guyana. So again, we can see sort of Huntley is a place in the northeast of Scotland, so the place names in different parts of the world changing because of Scottish interaction with slavery. So in this list, we can see that enslaved people were considered in many, many ways just as their value as property. So we can see their individual, their individual and their collective values listed. But I also think these lists are fascinating because we can see their names and in a way that kind of calls out that these were actually people with feelings and lives and it sort of makes a bid uh, for their own humanity and to look at them not just as chattel but as people who would have experienced great pain and sadness at being enslaved uh, but you know perhaps at other times would have had happiness and joy in their lives and um, so although this is just a list I think it is quite quite nuanced so the the next example is yet another list but in a different form it wasn't possible to get this document into the whole slide because it's huge. It's a big vellum um, legal instrument to sell a plantation uh, in Tobago, and it's dated 1774. So there's two huge big vellum slides, and it's full of sort of legalese, but essentially they were selling a plantation and people on it. Interestingly as well, actually, if you look on the right-hand side, we've got people. We've also got livestock, so that says something interesting about the mindset of some of the people who were involved in this. Also, there was two camels <laughs> on this plantation in Jamaica, um, so I do wonder how those camels got there. Moving on, we've got this account book. Now, I've included this because it seems quite innocuous, uh, and documents like this, do, but documents like this do occasionally mention main, uh, sort of examples of slavery buried in the small print. So, if we move to the next slide, we'll see like. You know, you could you could flick past that quite easily without realising what's in it. But if you stop and check, you can see, there we go, a mention of slaves. So the moral of that story is to keep your eyes peeled when you're at the National Library of Scotland. I thought this was interesting as well because although it doesn't actually refer to slavery overtly, this illustration is a good example of the kinds of responses that Scots created to their experience of travel to the West Indies, so lots of different forms of cultural production, be it literature or art. Um, and there seems to have been a kind of notion, certainly when you look at the other illustrations that are included in this volume, of a, a kind of a sense of the otherness in inverted commas of the Caribbean, how it was different in some way from Scotland. Um, and it's obviously moved this person to start to do these quite detailed drawings. So this is a drawing of a part of Jamaica. Then we've got an abolitionist medal. And this is perhaps the kind of quintessential or stereotypical image of an enslaved person from that period, sort of kneeling um, and in chains. Now, whether we'd want to use that image necessarily nowadays, whether it reflects the true complexity of the, the agency that enslaved people had, I don't know if it, it, it really does. Um, but nevertheless, it's a good example of something from the period. And we can see the back again, the sort of famous abolitionist motto. Now that's interesting as far as it goes, but again, in terms of actually what's in the collections, this is really interesting because it's a medal in a box in a manuscript department, but it's actually got photographs and things like that included in it, included the f including the first ever Scottish rugby team. <laughs> so again, a bit like the camels, how did those two things come together? So it shows you how sort of varied and eclectic the library's collections are. And lastly, just again, that's the, the newspaper article we looked at earlier, but just to reflect the printed collection. So lots of newspapers, lots of periodicals of that period that discuss slavery inside are, are held at the library. So now that I've discussed in kind of broad terms the, the scope and contents of the, the library slavery collections, 
I want to talk more specifically about how someone might use them to, to do some actual research to Scotland's slavery past. Come on. So, the first case, we're going to do two case studies. The first case study is about a guy called Richard Holden. And he's a very good example of a direct link between Scotland and the slave trade. Uh, the Holdens were a family from a place called Baldove, which is near Dundee. Uh, Richard Holden was a surgeon, and he was actually based in Bristol, or spent part of his time in Bristol. And he took part in at least a couple of slave trading voyages to Africa. Uh, and his letters that he sent back to his family just outside Dundee give really vivid accounts of these slave trading voyages. And they also show some of the quite interesting things that you can, some of the stories that you can put together using the library's materials, but I'll get to that bit in, in more detail. So let me tell you about Richard Holden for a minute. A letter from Richard to his brother John, written in 1750, confirms his first-hand experience of the slave trade. So he told John that he and his crewmates had sold, quote, young and old from 16 to 90 pounds apiece. And his letter suggested further that there was money to be made in these voyages. So he told John that, quote, a doctor's wage is about four pounds a month, and he has two privileged slaves at prime cost and liberty to pick them out of the whole cargo. In other words, he got to pick two people and sell them and keep the money. Plus, he also got one shilling per head commission on the number of people that he could get to the other side of the Atlantic. Now, a doctor's mate received no commission and was only given half pay whilst at sea, but Holden's letters do demonstrate clearly that there was potentially um, quite a lot of money in this for Scots who were willing to be involved, and also shows the really important role that Scots medics played in the slave trade. Now for this next part, you need to keep some dates and some names in mind. So listen carefully. On the 14th of August, 1751, Richard wrote to his brother Abraham that he'd set sail from Bristol and was en route to a place called Calabar, which is a port in what is now Southern Nigeria, aboard a ship captained by a Captain Miller. Uh, that's the letter that's on screen now. We can see here, it's talking about Guinea and Virginia. Right, so you might be able to see those lines clearly, but I'll just read them out if you're sitting further up at the back. He says, I believe we shall go from Guinea to Virginia to dispose of our slaves. Now Holden's letters show that he stayed around the coast of Calabar until about March um, 1752 when they set sail for Virginia. And then he told his brother that he'd arrived in Virginia on the 3rd of June, 1752. Now, Holden actually complained that, quote, he had made but an indifferent voyage this time, partly because, again, quote, one of my slaves had five months illness and did not recover before the rest got sold, which obliged me to sell him for little or nothing. Another letter uh, provides more detail about the fate of this enslaved person. Richard uh, told John that the man was, quote, had hardly any flesh left on him when he was sold, which caused me to take very little for him. I did not sell him till the day before we sailed, thinking to fatten him a little. And Holden's voyage, um, the disappointment of this voyage was actually compounded when he said, quote, a fine little boy that he hoped to send to Abraham had died in the Middle Passage. Now, Holden went on another slave trading voyage in 1753, sailing on a ship called the Anamabu, captained by a man called Hort to the Gold Coast, which is present day Ga uh, Ghana, and then to Jamaica. And the ship, the ship returned to Bristol in 1754, before Holden put out to sea again to go to Angola. So we've got various names, various dates. And as, as I say, these letters provide vivid first-hand accounts of the, and quite unsettling accounts of slave trading voyages that Scots were involved in. And they also provide useful evidence um, that Scots were indeed involved in the slave trade. But what's interesting from a researcher's perspective is how that raw information that I just mentioned contained in the letters can be corroborated by other sources to, to develop a very specific picture of Holden's movements. Uh, and furthermore, um, putting this evidence together um, shows with precision how many enslaved people were kidnapped from their homes and sold into enslavement aboard the ship staffed by Holden and his crewmates. So this is when you need to try and cast your mind back and remember some of this information. So the 1751-52 timeframe and Captain Miller to start with. So this is a screenshot from the, the Slave Voyages database, which is a big database of all the different slave trading voyages that took, that took place um, during the period of slavery. Um, it's well worth a look if you're interested in this kind of research. Now, the database actually verifies the testimony left behind in Holden's letters. So the slide isn't massively clear, but 
I'll sort of explain what's here. As you'll see from this slide, there's a specific record of a ship leaving Bristol in August 1751, which sailed to Calabar, and then reached the Upper James River in Virginia in June 1752. And the vessel was captained by one Alexander Miller. This is almost certainly holding 1751-52 slave trade and voyage. The entry shows that of the 304 enslaved people embarked in Calabar, only 260 made it to Virginia. And likewise, the 1753-54 voyage again corroborated a ship named the Anna Mabo, captained by a Samuel Hort, left Bristol in January 1753. And then it left Anna Mabu in Ghana in September 1753, then arrived in Kingston in early 1754 before it returned again to Bristol. And once again, this information ties up with the letters that Holden sent back to his brothers. And on this occasion, 210 people were put aboard a ship with 180 surviving the journey across the Atlantic. And bringing Richard Holden's transatlantic journey to a close, a letter from someone else, a person called Philip Atwood, back to Baldovi says that Holden died on the coast of West Africa in June 1758, again on another slave trading voyage. So the Holden family letters show two important things. First, it's an incontestable fact that Scots were involved with the slave trade, albeit often in voyages not originating in Scotland. The second is that the library's slavery collections can unlock incredibly precise details about the past. As I'll discuss next, though, it's not always possible to glean this level of detail from all the library's material. However, the, the holding letters show what kind of thing is open to researchers who are interested in this part of Scotland's past, and I would encourage you all to use the material available in the library. To move to our next case study, then, about James Ennis Jr. In at least one sense, archives aren't neutral. The material that is collected in an archive reflects the societies in which they were produced, and it also reflects society, the societies in which they've been collected. So more simply, archival material from the 18th and 19th century are more likely to relate to people who wielded influence and power during this period. And without placing blame on anyone, as it were, it's worth recognising that the library's slavery collections do bear that hallmark as well. So this privileging of certain types of archival material has an important knock-on effect for scholars who are interested in the history of slavery. In crude terms, it's far easier to find or hear the voice of the enslaver rather than the enslaved in the archive, at least not without a lot of hard work. And as a consequence, there are lots of gaps and silences in the library's collections as they relate to the lived experience of enslaved or formerly enslaved people. The story of James Ennis Jr., and James Ennis Sr., for that matter, his father, is a really interesting example of the archival gaps and silences that interfere with the, the possibility of a full understanding of the story of slavery, at least from the perspective of the enslaved. Now, James Ennis Sr. was a Shetlander who migrated to Jamaica and died on the island in April 1798. And a strange way, uh, death is quite good for historians because dead people produce documents they produce wills and they produce inventories and they also sometimes encourage people to write to their friends and family to try and sort things out or to convey news. So James Ennis Sr.'s death is a sort of boon for the purposes of this talk. And indeed James Ennis Sr.'s death did cause letters, a flurry of letters, to be sent back from Jamaica to Scotland. Uh, Ennis's untimely death means that we have a fairly good idea of what and indeed whom he owned in Jamaica. An inventory of Innes's property held in the library uh, shows that the, the legal property that he owned included 36 enslaved people valued at a total of £3,110. And in fact, the total value of his property full stop was £3,560, meaning that the enslaved people in question were kind of overwhelmingly the most valuable part of his estate. Uh, the consequence of Innes's death was that these enslaved people were put up for sale and were actually advertised in local newspapers as being up for sale. But Innes didn't just enjoy legal ownership over people like many other Scotsmen of the period. He had children with at least one enslaved woman. Indeed, Scots going to parts of the Caribbean and having children with enslaved women was a very common feature of their lives. And James Innes Jr. was one such child. Uh, he's a really good example of a formerly enslaved person about whom we know actually quite a lot, at least for a period of his life, but we never get it from his own perspective. 
So we never hear James Ennis Jr. speak. We never really get a glimpse inside his head and we never really get a chance to understand things from his viewpoint. So although we know his story, he's not the one who gets to tell us it, speaking again to these gaps and these silences. Ennis Sr.'s friend, Archibald Anderson, wrote home to Shetland to advise of Ennis's death and writing from an estate in Jamaica called Anchovy Valley, he told his friends back home that Ennis's son lived with him and that he was, quote, a fine, stout, healthy boy. A subsequent letter sent by Anderson implied that Ennis Jr. was enslaved. He reported, and he, Anderson, reported, quote, Mr. Ennis's reputed son, reputed son is always the sort of euphemism that they used um, because they didn't want to admit to having had these liaisons with enslaved women. Um, his, his reputed son, James, is well and lives with his mother on Anchovy Valley Estate. I expected his freedom would have been got this year and he sent home for education, but his father's property not being sold has put a stop to that for present. So in other words, James Ennis Sr. had this child with an enslaved woman and then consigned his own son to slavery. And the property in question that had to be sold in order to pay for James's manumission is the sale of other enslaved people. So this meant that in order for James Ennis Jr. to obtain legal freedom, other people had to remain legally unfree. A subsequent letter confirms that uh, Ennis Jr. was indeed freed, and in July 1803, Anderson wrote back to Lerwick that the young Ennis was on his way to Glasgow to then be conveyed to Shetland in the care of a merchant uh, based in John Street. Uh, from Glasgow, as I say, he was going to be sent back to Shetland. So James was given two days' notice that he was going to embark on this ship, a ship that was going to take him halfway across the world, again in inverted commas, home, um, to a place that he'd never seen before, perhaps he'd never even heard of before. A bill of exchange was sent to Shetland with him in order to defray his immediate expenses, and the source of that money was, quote, part payment of the Negroes that belonged to his father. So again, this person's freedom in his passage to Scotland home had been financed by the proceeds of the slave trade, which I think throws up really interesting and complex questions about this boy's life and about Scotland's interactions with the slave trade. Now, whether James was unaware of this really kind of paradoxical situation that he'd got himself or been put into, or how he felt about it if he did, remains unsaid. In fact, he actually disappears from the archival record after his arrival in Scotland. There is some more material about him in the, the library in Shetland. And to build a picture, of uh, Ennis Jr.'s life based on the source material would suggest that he was someone whose life was very much controlled by other people. He was buffeted from Jamaica to Shetland at the, the, group of the, uh, the whims of this group of adults without much of his say-so. And any trace of his power or his agency um, or the kind of power or agency of, of other enslaved people in general is difficult to find in these sources. So you need to do a lot of hard work reading between the lines, reading against the grain, trying to turn things on their head in order to get closer to the kind of personality and the power possessed by enslaved people. Now, there are occasional glimpses of this kind of agency in the library's uh, slavery collections, including mentions of resistance and violence uh, asserted by enslaved people, suggesting that, of course, they did have minds and interests of their own. But these are admittedly few and far between. So in my view, the question that arises from this is how researchers can use this, this type of material specifically that's contained in the library's collections to give some kind of voice to the enslaved or formerly enslaved people. And, and I would suggest that the power of empathy and imagination needs to be uh, deployed to do this. Now, empathy and imagination are quite awkward concepts for historians. So it's by training, they analyse source material in a obje supposedly objective way before they reach balanced conclusions about what they've, they've read. And they ask certain questions of their sources. Who wrote this? When did they write it? Why did they write it? To whom did they write it? But anything that doesn't appear in the evidence itself sort of sits outside the historian's purview. But perhaps by asking different questions, researchers can get closer to the experience of someone like James Ennis Jr. who was kind of sidelined or written out of the archive altogether. So here are some of the, the kinds of questions that an empathetic and imaginative researcher might ask. Did James know who his father was? How would he felt about having had an enslaved mother and an enslaver as a father? Did he want to come to Scotland, his supposed home? How must he have felt being taken from his family at such short notice and being moved halfway around the world? What was it like to be a person of colour in Lerwick in the early 1800s? That would be an unusual experience even today. 
Now, it's difficult to answer these questions definitively, but I would suggest that this story is not necessarily a happy one. But by engaging our ability to empathise with others, we might be able to write a fuller account of this story that lends some weight to James Ennis Jr's side of the story. Of course, the answers to these questions would necessarily be tentative, but in my view, they are better than the absolute silence that he's afforded in, the art in some of the archival sources. So that brings my part of the, the talk to an end. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you agree with me that the library has some really useful and fascinating collections. And I'd encourage you again, um, anyone with an interest in this type of stuff, to go upstairs and really engage with the material and write it up and, and try to get it out there in whatever way you can, be it Twitter or a blog or a website or some sort of more formal thing like a, an academic journal article for any academics in the room. Uh, so we've still got a bit of time left, uh, so I'm happy to take questions from the floor if there are any. Thank you. Thank you.